Venus has exceptionally high temperatures, hot enough to melt lead. It's the hottest planet in our solar system, with a high-pressure environment and super strong winds. The winds there are 50 times faster than the planet's rotation. It's getting stronger over time, and scientists don't know why. But they did find something interesting in the planet's clouds, a potential sign of decaying biological matter. Could there be life then? Not quite, since Venus has a dry, windy atmosphere and doesn't have enough water for life to develop. Rings around other planets are more common than we thought. Saturn's rings are the most famous and spectacular ones. They partially consist of reflective, sparkly water ice, and you can't see anything like that in the rest of our solar system. Jupiter, Uranus, and Neptune have ring systems too. And those most likely consist of dust and rocky particles. And not just planets, astronomers found out rings were around one asteroid as well. Speaking of rings, why do you think that Earth doesn't have them? Gas giants have rings, while the rocky ones don't. Two theories explain how rings form. They could be the remains from the times when planets were forming. Or they could be leftover material of an impact that destroyed an unknown moon. Or gravity broke apart this moon of its parent planet. It's not clear why only the gas planets have rings. They formed in the outer area of our solar system, while rocky planets only in its inner circles. Maybe a good clue. Maybe these inner rocky planets had just better protection from strong impacts that could have formed rings. Also, there are more moons in the outer solar system. And there are more rings there. Another thing may be that bigger planets have a bigger volume, so a ring system can remain stable there. Some theories even say that Earth used to have a ring system. A long, long time ago, our planet collided with a Mars-sized object, which most likely resulted in a dense ring of particles and debris. But our story was a bit different than the outer planets, and those rings probably combined and formed the Moon. Do we know the shape of the universe? Einstein had a theory of general relativity. It's said that the universe could be in one of these three forms, closed like a sphere, open like a saddle, or flat like a piece of paper. Its shape determines whether it's infinite or not, and whether it will expand forever or maybe collapse at some point. The shape of the universe depends on its density and rate of expansion. One of the best ways to determine its shape is to use something called the cosmic microwave background. It's the relic afterglow, something that's left of the Big Bang. Sound waves that were moving through the universe in its early stages produced quite small spatial variations in the temperature of its faint light. The result of these studies show that the universe probably expands in all directions, which means it's flat. How come our sun is hot while the moon is cold? The sun gives off heat because its core is extremely hot. In there, the pressure is pretty high. The hydrogen turns into helium. That's how the sun creates light and heat. The solar light and heat are enough to light up our days on Earth, as well as support life here, even though the sun is around 93 million miles away from us. The moon is not hot because it doesn't have an atmosphere, so it can't absorb sunlight as our planet does. Its surface gets very hot in the daytime, about 210 degrees Fahrenheit. But since there's no atmosphere, the temperature drops extremely during the night to negative 279 degrees Fahrenheit. The sun is hot, no doubt there, but the space around it is very cold. Heat is the energy object store inside of it. Temperature is how we measure if something is hot or cold. So when you transfer heat to certain objects, its temperature goes up. Take it away, and the temperature goes down. You can transfer heat in three different ways. Convection, conduction, and radiation. Convection works within gases and liquids, and conduction is for solids. The temperature only affects matter. Space doesn't have enough particles. It's nearly a complete vacuum, which means transferring heat is not effective. The only way to do it is through radiation. When the heat coming from the sun falls on an object in the form of radiation, the atoms that make up that object will absorb energy. 
This energy moves the atoms and makes them produce heat throughout this process. In space, temperatures of the objects stay the same for a long time. Cold objects stay cold, and hot ones stay hot. If you place anything outside of the Earth's atmosphere and expose it to direct sunlight, the sun will heat it to about 250 degrees Fahrenheit. Objects in outer space that surround our planet and don't receive sunlight directly are at 50 degrees Fahrenheit. The temperature is like this because there are molecules that escape our atmosphere, so the sun heats them. We used to think that water was really rare in space, but now we know there's water ice across our entire solar system. For starters, you can usually find water on asteroids and comets. It's also in craters on Mercury and the Moon that are in permanent shadows. On Mars, you'd find ice at its poles, under the surface dust and in frost. It might not be enough to support human colonies up there, but it's still something. Some other bodies in our solar system also contain ice, like the dwarf planet Ceres and one of Saturn's moons. Europa, one of Jupiter's moons, could be one of the most likely candidates we know about that could contain life. It probably has an entire ocean under its frozen and cracked surface. It could have twice as much water as all oceans on our planet together. Titan, the biggest of Saturn's moons, also has a liquid cycle, but it's not water. Its cycle moves materials between the surface and the atmosphere. At first, it sounds like the water cycle we have on Earth. But immense lakes on Titan are filled with ethane and methane. There's a chance they're over a layer of water. Neptune is about 30 times as far from the Sun as we are. Of course, it gets significantly less light and heat than Earth, but it also radiates way more heat than it's generating. There are more things happening in its atmosphere, especially if you compare it to its neighbor, Uranus. Uranus is closer to the Sun, but it still radiates the same amount of heat as Neptune. The winds on Neptune are insanely strong, 1,500 miles per hour. No one still knows why. It could be a gravitational contraction, energy coming from its core, or the Sun. I hope we'll eventually find out. Can you imagine hot ice? It exists just 33 light years away from us, on one exoplanet. This planet consists of different water elements and they form burning ice. The ice there is solid because of pressure, but the surface temperatures are extreme and go up to 570 degrees Fahrenheit. That's how the water stays super hot and comes off as steam. Picture putting ice in your coffee when you want to heat it up. When you stargaze, it's almost like you're looking into the past. Stars are really far away, and it takes longer for their light to reach our planet. So it's possible some of them have already run out of fuel and aren't alive anymore. The pillars of creation are a good example. This is part of a region 7,000 light years away from us called the Eagle Nebula. These are clouds of gas and dust in the shape of pillars. Scientists first discovered it in 1995, but in reality, a supernova explosion destroyed these pillars that were at least 6,000 years ago. So, the 1995 image shows these pillars from 7,000 years ago. Mars has the biggest volcano in the solar system that we know of so far. It's bigger than the whole state of Hawaii and 100 times larger than the biggest volcano on Earth. The red planet seems so quiet, but once upon a time, large volcanoes dominated its surface. Volcanoes on the red planet can probably grow so big because gravity there is a lot weaker than down on Earth. Also, the crust on our planet is moving all the time, and the Martian crust probably stays still. You may think the Earth is pretty big, but the Sun makes up almost 99.9% .9 of the mass of the whole solar system. The rest of the mass is made up by the planets and their satellites, asteroids, comets, gas, and dust. It's around 93 million miles away from our planet, but it keeps us warm every day. Its temperature is about 10,000 degrees Fahrenheit, but the space surrounding it is still cold as ice. To understand this, we need to distinguish between heat and temperature. Heat is the energy inside some object. Temperature is something that tells us if that object is hot or cold. When the heat is transferred to that object, it makes its temperature go up. 
When the object is losing heat, the temperature goes down. Heat can be transferred in three different ways. The sun does it through radiation. That means it's releasing heat in the form of light. Your body radiates heat too, as infrared waves. That's why thermal imaging cameras will detect that you're in the room even at night. The hotter the object, the more heat it will radiate. The temperature only affects matter. Since space is mostly a vacuum, it doesn't have enough particles for heat to transfer in any other way than through radiation. When the heat from the sun gets to an object, the atoms start absorbing energy, but the heat can't transfer since there is no matter in space. Those rare atoms and molecules in space will absorb the heat. And they'll simply stay that way, while the cold vacuum will stay cold. There's a lot of matter inside Earth's atmosphere, so the energy of the sun can transfer easily. But if you put an object outside of the Earth's atmosphere in direct sunlight, it would end up heated to 250 degrees Fahrenheit because it's matter made of atoms and molecules. The temperature of the vacuum is negative 454 degrees Fahrenheit. That means, depending on where you are, space can either burn or freeze you. The sun isn't actually yellow. It emits light over a wide range of wavelengths. We can tell both its temperature and color by the peak in its spectrum. For instance, cooler stars will appear red, and hotter stars will be blue with yellow, orange, and white stars in between. When it comes to the sun, the spectrum peaks at a wavelength we'd usually call green, but our eye perceives it differently. So, the shade of green in combination with other wavelengths from the spectrum is going to look white to the human eye. We generally see the sun as yellow because our atmosphere scatters blue light more efficiently than the red one. During sunrise and sunset, there's more red light in the spectrum of the sun, which gives us amazing sceneries. Sunspots are part of the sun's visible surface that are on average way cooler than the sun itself. They overlap with parts that have an increased magnetic field. These parts don't allow the release of heat to the sun's visible surface. That way, the rest of the sun's surface is three times brighter than those sunspots. That contrast makes them appear almost black. If we could take a sunspot apart from the sun and place it somewhere in the night sky, it would be different as bright as the moon when we see it from the Earth. All the planets in our solar system spin in the same direction because they were formed from one protoplanetary cloud, except for Uranus and Venus. They have probably had some strong impact on them that made them spin in the opposite direction. But it's different with galaxies. They don't usually form the same cloud of dust and particles. Also, they're not randomly distributed across space. They come in filaments, dense, slender strands of dark matter and galaxies, with voids in between. Proto-galaxies are linked by gravitational forces in small areas of space. This is probably because of the distribution of dark matter throughout the universe. The matter in the filaments moves in a corkscrew motion and goes towards the densest area. So, there might be a common direction galaxies tend to spin, but it's mostly random. There's a possibility we'll see a lunar elevator one day. Yep, a cable anchored to the surface of the moon. It would stretch 250,000 miles. We wouldn't be able to directly attach it to our planet because both Earth and the moon are moving. But we could keep it terminated high in our planet's orbit. Some researchers believe we could build such an elevator for a few billion dollars. The moon has resources we could definitely use. A rare form of helium found there could be of use in fusion power stations on our planet. Also, we could take some other rare elements and use them in smartphones and the rest of electronics. So, after around 53 trips up and down, the elevator could pay for itself. The cable would be as thick as a pencil, but its weight would be around 40 tons. It could even be made of materials we already have here on Earth with no need to invent something. There could even be a combination of two elevators. A spacecraft would winch up an elevator from the surface of our planet to a space station. Then it would be flung towards the moon. There would be another elevator to finally lower it down to the surface of the moon. Planets in our solar system have predictable and stable orbits. 
but gas giant collisions could have happened at an early stage when a planetary system was still forming. In case of a head-on collision, two gas giants would merge. They wouldn't end up losing their mass, the materials in their gaseous envelopes, or the ones in their solid cores. Such a collision at a higher speed would cause the loss of the major part of the envelope gas, and very high speeds, boom, both planets are gone. It's different if it's not a head-on collision. If two cores manage to completely avoid each other, gas giants won't merge, but they'll lose some of the mass. Gas giants might even change their shape due to such collisions. Astronomers found out there's a galaxy extremely far away from us that looks similar to our Milky Way. We now see it as it was when the universe was only 1.4 billion years old, and now it's 13.8 billion years old. It took over 12 billion years for the light to come from this faraway galaxy and reach our planet. This galaxy is peaceful, stable, and surprisingly non-chaotic, unlike all other galaxies that were quite turbulent in their early stages. To leave the Milky Way, we'd have to travel around 25,000 light-years away from the center of the galaxy, or 500 light-years vertically. Our galaxy is a disk of stars that spreads around 100,000 light-years across and is 1,000 light-years thick. The Sun, its central star, is located halfway from the center of the galaxy and close to the middle of the disk in the vertical direction. We'd have to go further than its edge to get away from the halo that surrounds the Milky Way, old stars, diffuse gas, and globular clusters. If you wanted to go even further to see the Milky Way in all its glory, you'd have to travel 48,000 light-years vertically. At this moment, we don't even have a telescope we can send there. There are central stars that eat planets. Our solar system is stable, unlike many other planetary systems. So we don't have to be afraid the Earth or some other planet will change its orbit and go towards the Sun. But at least a quarter of other planetary systems with orbiting stars similar to the Sun have a pretty chaotic past. In some of them, there are planets that used to move around, and their unpredictable migrations have disrupted the paths of some other planets, or even pushed them outside of their orbit. That means some planets probably have fallen into the central star. When that happens, the planet gets dissolved in the outer layer of the star, which means it gets eaten. Soaring temperatures of more than 11,000 degrees Fahrenheit, solid rocks of blazing superhot fire, immense pressures three and a half million times stronger than on the surface of the Earth. These are just some of the things cooking 1,800 miles beneath your feet as you're watching this video. How? The sun is burning with a temperature similar to our planet's core, but it's 93 million miles away. So why isn't Earth melting away from its own core? Our little blue planet is made of many layers stacked one upon another. The inner core, the outer one, the mantle, and the crust. The deeper you go, the hotter and more pressurized it gets. Plate tectonics are layers of the mantle and crust piggyback riding, forever moving and just having a good time. Scientists discovered there are nine plates in total in different parts of the world. When these plates move and grind on each other, earthquakes occur. Energy is released as a result, and we feel it on the surface. Think of it as trying to shut a car door after stuffing it to the brim. When you realize there's something in the way, remove it and boom, everything topples. Billions of years ago, our lands were all interlocked in what was called Pangaea. But slowly, and I mean slowly, over the years, the continents drifted apart into what we have right now. The Earth was also cooler on the inside, but it slowly started generating more heat in the core. Earthquakes are measured with intensity and magnitude. We see how far the effects of an earthquake reach through magnitude, and the intensity is the measure of its power. Over at the mantle, the cooler rocks begin sinking, and hot material from the core rises up. When this happens, the plates begin moving, and as a result, they create mountains, hills, and bodies of water we have today. None of these things happen overnight. It takes millions of years to actually see something. All the way in the layers of the Earth, there are different sources of heat, mainly from when the planet was initially formed. 
Friction heating occurs when materials begin sinking down to the center of the Earth. Since the Earth is surrounded by a solid mantle, the crust floating on top of it acts as a barrier to protect us from the Earth's insides. But the secret for its success is the difference between heat and temperature. Simply put, heat is just energy, and temperature is its density. If the Sun was 1,800 miles away from the surface of the Earth and boiling at the same temperature as our core, we would melt like ice cream on a hot, sunny day. A shock from a small, short circuit when plugging out your phone charger from the socket won't be too harmful, even though a spark can have temperatures of around 2,700 degrees. But if you dipped your body in a boiling bath of hot water at around 200 degrees, let's just say it's not worth it. Just because the temperature of the sun's surface is roughly the same as the Earth's core doesn't mean the heat distribution is the same. The Earth's core is teeming with iron throughout the layers. But on the surface, the iron atoms are arranged into cube shapes. That's when iron is in normal room temperature and regular pressure. But put in extreme conditions, the atomic shape changes into hexagons. For a long time, scientists thought that the iron in the core was hexagon-shaped. But they found out it retained its cubic formation 1,800 miles underground. Since the core has so much pressure, the atoms simply don't have a place to move to change their shape. If you were standing in a subway train that was packed full, you wouldn't even have space to lift your arm. But everyone inside is able to switch positions while keeping the original shape. That's why the structure of the Earth's core is solid and not liquid. The atoms are so tightly packed that they can't even transition into a liquid state. But in a world where the Earth's core liquefied, we'd witness the worst consequences, starting with major and mass volcanic eruptions, earthquakes, and tidal waves. Every major hotspot would be in danger, and the ring of fire would be a non-stop fountain of lava spewing out. Cool material from the upper layers sinks down to the core and vice versa. With a liquid and incredibly unstable core, This process would be much faster. Every major city and town by the coast would be washed away by tidal waves, and all the volcanoes erupting will blacken the sky with ash and smoke. This would temporarily block the sunlight from entering our atmosphere and eventually force anything flying in the air to remain on the ground. The lands we currently live on would feel like ice breaking away from a glacier and floating off. Many dormant volcanoes would wake up from their slumber and spew out their morning lava all over the place. The ground formation and structure would change permanently. Magma from the bottom of the ocean trenches would find its way up to the surface and change the currents in the oceans. The Arctic Ocean and Antarctica would melt away and add to the rise of water levels all around the northern and southern hemispheres, and eventually the world. Wildlife on land wouldn't be able to flourish and all the greenery would disappear. Marine life would have to find a way to escape the changes in the ocean temperature. The world economy would crash as an international emergency would be declared to try and figure out a way to stop this. But humanity would barely make it alive and would have to strive to continue existing. Well, of course, something like this will never happen. But if the Earth's core cooled down, then we wouldn't have massive volcanic eruptions no devastating earthquakes nor tidal waves. In fact, none of these things would happen since they require energy to function. The continents would stop moving and changing. Sounds cool, right? Mm, No. This means that the magnetic field protecting our planet would disappear, which would make us extremely vulnerable to cosmic radiation, as well as asteroids and meteorites. The sun's rays will feel even more intense than usual, which will make it extremely unsafe for anyone to go outside. The heat produced in the core is responsible for recycling the carbon that goes back to the surface. Now, recycling would stop altogether. Carbon is an essential part of carbon dioxide that plants need to survive. So all the trees and plants on the surface and in the water would stop growing and wouldn't be able to produce oxygen for the rest of the world. With cosmic radiation and lack of oxygen, humans would have to live in bunkers with artificial ventilation systems. The Earth's surface would become a no-go zone and start to resemble Mars. With nothing to power the Earth from the inside, it'd begin to dry up and crumble internally. Much of the Earth's surface is made out of oxygen, so without it, we would eventually see something like major sinkholes around the world. 
sinkholes that can take down cities like New York and Paris, along with landslides in many cities and unstable landscapes all over the place. Every single city's infrastructure would eventually collapse and make the ground unwalkable. So even if you did live in an underground bunker, chances are the foundation wouldn't last and you'd be exposed to the cosmic radiation. But all of this can vanish in the blink of an eye if an asteroid comes falling down. Whether it's tiny or colossal, we would be seeing more of those than actual rain. Without a magnetic field, the Earth can't block any foreign object that flies through our atmosphere. If an asteroid the size of Rhode Island came falling down, the damage would be much more than with the Earth's core hot and running. With the ground as fragile as potato chips, the ripple effect would be much wider and cause more indirect destruction around us. The Earth would eventually collapse in on itself and break into pieces until it's lost its own gravitational energy. It'd end up being a bunch of rocks and pebbles floating around in the emptiness of space. But nothing like that will happen either. We're living fine with our solid hot Earth core. As long as it's doing okay, then we can keep on doing our thing.